Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great, great to be with you and great to be back from my sabbatical time. Some of you I know I've not seen since I returned, so it's especially great to see you, those of you that I've not seen. Um, so I, I have to finish Sally's thought for her. So, um, you know, when, when I last saw some of you, um, you know, often I would tell you about Emmy the Wonder Dog that was right at my feet often when I was teaching uh, from home. I'm in my office today. Uh, but my first week of sabbatical, if you can believe it, um, our dear Emmy was diagnosed with a really aggressive cancer and oh, no. we ended up uh, needing to put her to sleep. So um, that was kind of sad, but you know, I don't, most of you know me well enough to know I don't do well without a dog. So, <laughs> oh golly, I, you know, Roger was getting a little put out with me because at night I would have my iPad and be flipping through looking at the rescue places. <laughs> so um, I was taken in by uh, Penny's eyes. They're just really beautiful eyes and um, yeah. went down. And so we ended up um, adopting our dear Penny about Oh, early part of July. And um, she is, uh, now's, now's the part that may be unusual to you. She is, um, as most rescues, a mixed breed, but uh, here's the mix. She is a Catahoula cattle dog slash uh, black mouth cur, C-U-R which means working dog, basically. So she's a Catahoula cattle dog and a black mouth cur. And um, to give you a frame of reference on black mouth cur, how many of you uh, as kids saw that movie, Old Yeller? Kind of had an unhappy ending, but which <laughs> let's not talk about that. But um, Old Yeller was a black mouth cur. Isn't that wild? Yeah. So, and interestingly, Penny looks just like Old Yeller. So that gives you a little frame of reference. She's a uh, high energy, loves to walk with Roger and me and just a sweet, sweet dog. So anyway, that's the fun fact about uh, my uh, time away. And uh, I'm sure other facts will leak out about my time away, but uh, mostly it was just fantastic. And as some of you know, I was so pining to see uh, our daughter and son-in-law and actually got to see them three times while I was on um, sabbatical. So it was great. All right, so that's enough of me. Um, I did want to, under the heading of announcements, uh, let you know that um, I think everyone by now is caught up with uh, the uh, bittersweet news that our, our dear Pastor Emeritus, um, Bob Sanders, passed away this uh, last week. And Bob, um, what a great life and legacy, and we're, we thank God for him. We will have a time to do that publicly. We'll have a public memorial service on October the 9th. That's a Saturday. That'll be at two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, it will be in person here in the sanctuary. Um, I do know that some of you are leery of, you know, reentering the sanctuary at this point, and that's okay. We'll live stream it. So you have two options. You can either come in person and or live stream, but uh, it'll be a a wonderful celebration of a great life and offering thanks and praise to God for the reality of the resurrection and that we have hope of life beyond the grave. So anyway, hope that you'll participate in that in some way and uh, you're certainly welcome to. Um, again, if you've not had a chance to do so, it'd be great if you could mute yourself if uh, while I'm speaking because it, it uh, would help all of us to hear better, I think. Um, other announcements, just so you know, um, we always know that our first couple of weeks of Bible study, we're just ramping up and, and getting people kind of on board. So there may be favorite uh, Bible study friends that are not with us today, and always good to give a gentle reminder that we're back meeting again. <laughs> um, we do have options this time. Some people are meeting in small groups off campus in homes, and that's great, too. Uh, the study book is great and uh, available. Uh, as I said before, our office is open uh, with the doors unlocked nine to three every day. So that's how you can secure it from Brian. Okay, um, probably lots of other announcements, but I think that'll suffice for today. Um, but let's, uh, let's jump in. Let's talk about our new study for this fall. Um, 
I uh, was thinking and praying coming out of sabbatical uh, about where to from here. And I was going to gather our leadership team, all of our able teachers and hosts and chat with them about a direction. And as I was praying about it, I happened upon a catalog that I rarely look at, but I just was leafing through it. And you know what absolutely grabbed my attention? It was that. It was the cover of this study book. And then I looked at the title, Be Still and Know, A Study of Rest and Refuge. And I thought, shoot, we can go with that. So anyway, I, on the strength of that, I ordered it and then leafed through it. And I thought, wow, OK, this is the study for us. And I think um, God's kindness really is on display in this, because I think our God really knew that a year and a half into this pandemic, um, hey, uh, who among us couldn't use a little rest and refuge, right? Uh, so um, the basis of this study is kind of a deep dive into the psalm that we'll be looking at today, Psalm 46. And I think the opening lines of that uh, psalm have been kind of a, a bedrock for us these last many months of this pandemic. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Uh, therefore, we will not fear. Um, during this long period of, um, you know, ups and downs and so forth, I think we have come back to that psalm and again and again and have longed for the refuge and the rest that our God offers to us. So this is going to be a 10-week study together. And we'll be exploring, um, especially today, really diving into the promises that we discover in Psalm 46. And then, interestingly, how these promises are fulfilled in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So for the next nine studies after this one today, we'll be looking at how Jesus embodies the promises of Psalm 46 and his encounters with people just like you and me. So that'll be really neat. So uh, when we come together each week, and this is really important, if you look at the table of contents, for each of the 10 weeks, there's um, in red at the very top of each week, there's kind of a, a storm of, and then it might be shame, which is next week or something like that. And then um, a passage. And I think the passage for next week, I'm gonna look at it really quick, just to make sure I'm telling you right. Yeah, so uh, the session two next week is the storm of sin, the woman caught in adultery, John 8, 2 through 11. So that'll be the basis of the teaching. Pastor Susan will be teaching next week. So even if you've not read anything in your study book, um, come every week. You, re you remember that this is a grace Bible study. Some weeks are more heavy than others. We just want you here and in fellowship with us. Um, but the deep dive each week will be into just that one passage. However, your study uh, book is so rich that it actually has five um, weekdays worth of devotional material that kind of travel through lots of different passages that relate to the theme of the week. And if you have time and, and want to discipline yourself to read through those, um, it's rich. Wow, I've been reading through several of the weeks and there's just a lot there. So anyway, I, I commend that to your attention. Some of the small groups that we'll be meeting are going to be exploring, you know, those uh, materials and the questions that are in them. Um, so lots of different ways that you can participate in this Bible study. And if you bump into one of our friends that says, gee, I can't come on Wednesday mornings this, this fall, really urge them to get a copy of the book and follow along anyway. That way they won't be left out. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, teaching times. So each week, kind of our stable constant will be our teaching times. They are being recorded. If you notice in your upper, on my screen, it's in my upper left, it just tells me that we're being recorded. We're only recording the teaching time. We're not gonna be recording the small groups. What goes on in small group stays in small group. So, um, but we do record the teaching time and then we uh, post that you know, on our um, YouTube site and also, Brian, as I understand it from his email, is going to be uh, sending that link to you so that 
even if you were here today, you know, you, you can see it again if you want to or go back through it and or pass it on to somebody else. So easy to get to those teaching links. And some of the small groups, that's what they're doing. They're watching the teaching on their own and then coming together for discussion. So uh, let's see, that's all to be said about that. Okay, is that enough housekeeping? At least it gives you an idea of where we're headed. Yeah. If you can have available before you, um, you know, especially uh, the copies of uh, Psalm 46 and so forth as we begin, why then uh, you'll be all set. And there's also some small group questions for later. But let's, uh, let's begin just by looking at uh, that first handout that says um, Psalm 46 from the New Revised Standard Version, NRSV. That's uh, where we're going to go first. Have you ever noticed when you look at uh, the book of Psalms uh, that often right at the very beginning, there's kind of some words that sometimes we don't even look at because we think, oh, well, you know, it's just something that tells me a little more about the psalm. But, you know, actually, um, for this particular psalm, it is kind of important to look at what we find right underneath Psalm 46. Um, in, in our translation, mine, in our SV, we see, to the leader of the Korahites, according to Alamoth, a song. Huh, okay, <laughs> what the heck does that mean? Well, it tells us probably one of the most important things we need to know about Psalm 46 right from the get-go. It's a song. It was meant to be sung. Yeah, I mean, so often we look at the printed page and we forget these are songs that were used in the worship of God by God's people. Um, to the leader. Well, who's the leader? Well, um, basically, it's the choir director. So in a sense, it's um, like saying that it, this song belongs to the collection of the choir director. So in our context, we might say, oh, this is one, one of Wendy Bavante's songs that she has in her files. So anyway, that's what the first thing means. But then of the Korahites, well, who in the world are, are they? Should I know about that? Well, in some translations, it says the sons of Korah. And basically, these are Levitical priests who were musicians. Yeah, it was like that was their specialized ministry, was leading the people of God as musicians. So again, accentuating that this is a piece of music. Um, and then according to the Alamoth, well, in some translations, it says uh, to the high lonesome, which makes it even more obscure to me. What the heck does that mean? Um, we don't really know. We think that what that refers to is a melody or a style of music. It might be in our day and time like saying, oh yeah, it's a contemporary song. Uh, we really don't know. And then the last thing is reinforcing what we know to be true. It's a song. Yeah. So, okay, I thought it would be kind of fun just to do a little bit of reflecting and you might want to jot some notes in your margin and we'll talk about it a little bit in small group. So, Think with me for just a minute. What, what is a favorite worship song of yours or a hymn? And I want you to think about the words of that particular worship song or hymn. Why is it a favorite? What, is, what does it affirm to you about God? What does it affirm to you about us as human beings and our relationship to God, or maybe the world in which we live. Again, you're just thinking. For me, you know, probably I have so many favorites, but if I think about what draws me in, um, you know, I, I, um, I love holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. It was a, the hymn that uh, my husband and I, we didn't have a traditional procession in our wedding, but we processed to holy, holy, holy. And so it has deep meaning to me, but it, it really speaks of this God that I love and, and worship who is holy meaning unlike any other. So I don't know what your answer is, but hold that thought. You're going to get a chance to talk about it in small group, but if we were to ask the same question that I just asked of you, of a Hebrew worshiper, well, 
they might answer, my favorite song is, God is our refuge and strength, which is the very first line of our song. We think it was probably that prominent in the worship of God's people. Now, interestingly, and, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bob Sanders today, because he certainly is on my heart and mind, a dear friend of mine. If I were to ask Bob Sanders that question, I know what he would tell me. He had such a deep love of the hymns, but he would tell me, open my memorial service with a mighty fortress is our God, which by the way, is a poetic meditation on um, Psalm 46. It was written by Martin Luther, the great reformer. And as we were several years ago talking, Bob and I, about his memorial service, um, he asked me, well, just make sure that we open it with a mighty fortress is our God. Isn't that beautiful? Because it says so much about his convictions about God. Yeah. It's helpful to remember that these are not just words in yeah. Psalm 46. Uh, they are words sung by the people of God through the ages, through so many different circumstances. Uh, why? Well, because it reinforced to them um, deeper understandings of this God that they knew and loved and served and depended upon in good times and in not so good times and hard times. Now, Psalm 46 is often referred to rightly as a psalm of trust, a psalm of trust, trust in God. So what I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to read aloud from uh, Psalm 46 out of the New Revised Standard. And as I do so, I hope you have a pencil or pen nearby. I would love for you to look for repetition. Remember my mantra, whenever scripture repeats itself, it's important. Pay attention. So be looking for repetition as you hear words or phrases repeated. Um, it might be helpful just to underline or circle them, words and phrases that are repeated. Um, okay, so let's do it. Hope you have your pencil or pen at hand, and let's listen for God to speak through Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And that's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have wondered, uh, at least if you look in terms of repetition, three different times we have that selah, the word uh, uh, there. You might ask me, well, what does that mean? Um, don't know. <laughs> it is, um, well, our, our knowledge of that is imprecise, which is to say it's a musical rest, again, reinforcing that this is a song, um, but we don't know in terms of translation exactly what the word means, but it is a rest, a stop in a song. So there you have it. So I bet you heard lots of repetition, yeah, of words and phrases as we went through. Um, 
it is clear, though, is it not, if you really look carefully, that the heart of this psalm is the word refuge. I think it's repeated, what, about three different times at least, refuge. Interestingly, there is a, a guy who's a, a scholar who specializes on the Psalms. His name is Jerome Creech. And <clears throat> he says, he makes the case, the argument that God as refuge is the central theological witness. In other words, it's, it's kind of the heart and soul uh, of the entire book of Psalms, this word refuge. And if you think about it, yeah, I mean, that's often... Um, attributed to God, God as refuge. Um, some might even argue that that's the concept that is at the heart of the whole Bible, but we'll get into that another day. For our purposes today, in terms of looking at the Psalms, um, wow. And I gave, I, I don't know, if, well, I gave you my notes. So actually you have my notes. Psalm, Psalm 2 verse 12 says this, happy are all who take refuge in him, in God. And then Psalm 16, verse 1, protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. And then some very famous words from Psalm 91, verse 1, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Actually, the words uh, refuge and fortress, they in, in Hebrew, they are essentially analogous terms. It's almost as though the psalmist is saying, my refuge and my refuge, my God in whom I trust. Yeah. So notice that it's not simply that God is a refuge. Kind of like, you remember how uh, as you drive toward... Um, you know, on Highway 99 South, as you're going toward Sherwood, there's a, a beautiful bird refuge on your right-hand side. You know, so God is a refuge, kind of like a bird sanctuary. No, no. What the scripture is saying is God is our refuge. Please notice the personalization of this psalm. God is our refuge. When the Bible describes God as refuge, it's saying that God is our safe place our safe place, uh, when we need protection from something. And again, you'll get some time to talk about uh, this next reflection in your small groups, but I, I would ask you, when you were a child, where or who was your safe place? Either the place or the one that you ran to for protection, who or where was your refuge? And I would fast forward to adulthood. In adulthood, where do you turn for protection and safety? Again, you'll talk some about that in small group, but just for us to think about that and personalize as we're moving through our psalm. Okay, speaking of moving through our psalm, we're going to do it again. But this time, if you'd look for your handout that says Psalm 46, Structure, Movement, and Development. So sorry, Linda Wagner's not here today because she loves it when I'm logical and sequential. <laughs> That's what we've got going here today. Um, so here's the deal. Um, very little of scripture is crafted in a willy-nilly sort of way. Um, I mean, every word, because it is God-breathed, is not willy-nilly. It's very specific, but especially the Psalms. Um, the psalmists were really intentional with how they structured um, each psalm, the poetry of each psalm. Psalms were carefully crafted uh, to emphasize certain, accentuate certain understandings of God. For example, you'll remember, um, I think it was last year, we studied Psalm 145. And what you might remember is that Psalm 145 is what we call an acrostic, acrostic psalm. And what that simply means is that each stanza begins with a letter of um, the Hebrew alphabet. And the psalmist, uh, it's kind of like what we often do with kids, you know, in Sunday school when we're teaching them. A is for how Jesus is our blessed assurance. I mean, it, it's similar in the Hebrew that from A to Z, these are all the reasons why God is worthy of our praise. 
And that's just how Psalm 145 is crafted. It, it's intended, and it's a little lost on us as English speakers, but in Hebrew, it's like a Hebrew listener would say, oh yeah, every letter of the alphabet's there. So anyway, um, what I want to say to you is that in order to understand any psalm of the 150 psalms in our Bible, we must first understand its structure, its movement, and its development. And just think of it this way. It's like a good plot in a, a story. It's going somewhere. There's a point to it. And, and everything is leading us to that point. There's divisions, there's turning points, and it builds up and it resolves. And it's, it's great the way Psalms are constructed. And this is so true of Psalm 46. It was lovingly crafted by a psalmist who wanted to accentuate certain truths about our God and our relationship to our God. So um, again, remember, it's a song. So it's got three stanzas and it has um, two, two repetitions of a chorus or a refrain, okay? So if you have that out in front of you, I'm just gonna walk you through it because I think it's just really cool the way it's put together. Um, so there's a logical flow, uh, as you can see, Basically, um, it's, a, it's a meditation on God's presence and protection, this God in whom we trust. And in the first stanza, we're looking at God's presence and protection from nat what's called natural evil. In other words, the natural world. It's not that the world is evil, but you know when bad things happen in the natural world, that's what we're trying to say. The second stanza is God's presence, and protection, presence in and protection from moral evil. In other words, it's not that all human beings are you know, evil all the time. What it's saying is that when things happen between human beings that are evil, that sort of thing, God is our presence in and protection from. And then uh, the chorus, which is the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And then the third stanza, God's overcoming of both natural and moral evil. And then the chorus brings us home. So that's where we're going. And I'll take us through each of the different stanzas in the chorus. So in stanza one, uh, it begins, oh, I should say one thing. This looks a little bit different than what we read in NRSV, and I'll tell you why. Um, what you have in front of you is a really careful translation of the Hebrew um, a wonderful Old Testament scholar who is one of my very favorites, a guy named Rolf Jacobson. And so what you have there is a more literal translation from the Hebrew. And the reason I did it this way is so that you could see some of the repetitions and whatnot. So don't be thrown by that. Okay, so um, again, uh, I think what I'd like to do is read through the whole shebang. And I want you again to do what we did earlier. And that is, again, to, to listen for repetition and circle or underline repeated words or phrases. Okay, so here we go. God is our refuge and strength, a clear help found in troubles. Therefore, we do not fear when the earth quakes, when mountains shake in the heart of the seas, when its waters rage and roil, when mountains heave with its arrogance. A river, its streams make glad the city of God. The Most High makes his dwelling holy. God is in its midst. It shall not be shaken. God will help it when morning dawns. Nations rage, kingdoms shake. He raises his voice, earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, see the deeds of the Lord, the desolations that he has made on the earth. He causes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He shatters the bow, breaks the spear, and burns the shields with fire. Be silent and know that I am true God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. 
Well, clearly, the concept of God as refuge is right at the heart and soul of this passage uh, in its translation as well. Um, it starts in stanza one, if you want to take your eyeballs up there, with a threefold description of God. God is refuge, strength, and help, or clear help. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that. In the Hebrew language, even more specifically, um, refuge and strength is translated, God is for us, a refuge and strength. That's the literal translation. I love that. I don't know about you, but God is for us, a refuge and strength. It's uh, reminiscent, a kind of an echo of this passage in the New Testament would be uh, Romans chapter 8. God is for us. Not just a, a hypothetical or, you know, God could be a refuge for somebody else. No, God is a refuge for us. A reliable refuge, a safe place worthy of our trust. That's what's being said in this particular stanza. And God is a strength. Well, basically what's being said there is God is sovereign. He has no rival. There is no one like him. He is strong enough to deliver and save. Um, in essence, uh, he will deliver what he says he will do. That's what's being said there. If he makes a promise, he's going to make good on it. He's going to deliver. Why? Because he's got the power to do so. He's sovereign. He has that strength. And his power is inclined to us to be our help. Our clear help. I love that. Clear. What's meant by clear is well-proven. God is our well-proven help. I mean, sometimes when we're in the midst of really desperate circumstances, isn't it great to sit back and think back, remember to when we've experienced God's help in the past, and it certainly gives us strength in the present, doesn't it? So God is a clear, well-proven, present help in the face of clear and present danger. That's what the scriptures are saying. The, the key to understanding the rest of this stanza is understanding uh, what I would call a Near East uh, worldview. Uh, among the Near Eastern people of this time, they really, the mountains were important, yes, but they were important for lots of different reasons. Their worldview suggested to them that the mountains held up the sky and also uh, kept, um, you know, the um, dry land from breaking apart and falling into the water. I mean, so in other words, it, that's, um, you might look at uh, the mountains as a scaffolding on which everything hangs, you know, the, keeps the sky up and the waters, you know, where it's supposed to be. Um, so you can, you can see that if something's happening with the mountains, oh my goodness, we're toast. It, it's going to be a bad thing. Um, water, as I've talked about before in the Hebrew cosmology or understanding, is um, symbolic of chaos, trouble. Um, you know, so what the psalmist is trying to get at here is if the mountains are, um, if the earth is quaking and the mountains are shaking and the waters are, are roiling and raging, this is um, a worst case scenario. The psalmist is trying to craft it in a way that you see that this is not just a run of the mill earthquake, like a, you know, a 4.0 or whatever. This is the worst possible earthquake and shaking of the mountains that you can imagine. And he's trying to make a, you know, an interpretive leap to this is something happening in our lives that feels like the very worst case scenario. And I would say to you, uh, when I was a kid, this is my example of my worst case scenario. Uh, I was probably maybe 10 or 11 years old grow up in, growing up in California in the Bay Area. And this is not a place, this is not like Florida or Louisiana. This is not a place prone to hurricanes. And we actually had a freak hurricane. And uh, the air base that was close to where I lived in South San Jose, actually uh, the winds were so strong that it wiped out uh, the gauge that they had at the air base at 120 miles. So we don't really know exactly how strong the winds were that night because the 
after 120, we, we couldn't keep count. But uh, the home, my childhood home was being battered. Oh my gosh. The wind, we had sliding glass doors in our um, living room and they were actually bowing in, buckling. It was the most terrifying thing I have ever been through in my life. It was awful. I, yeah, I don't even know to this day why those uh, doors didn't shatter. They should have, but they didn't buckle completely. Um, it was just terrifying. And the roof of my childhood home was sailing away on the wind. I mean, ripping these huge pieces of our roof. And I just remember the one feeling that I had in that moment with my family was terror. And okay, so pause button. That's what the psalmist is trying to get at here is that this is terrifying. In the most terrifying moments, God is our refuge and strength, our very present, well-proven help in even a trouble like that, a disturbance in the natural order. And so we don't fear. Even though we have raging and roiling and very dangerous, cold, um, life-taking waters that logically when engender fear, nevertheless, we do not fear. And then we shift in stanza two to God's presence and protection from moral evil. And the shift there is to a river in the Hebrew, and you have it the, there in front of you. That's the image that we're going from this roiling and stuff to a river. Now, supposedly, this river is near the city of God, which is Jerusalem, uh, God's chosen dwelling place where the temple was. Um, the temple, which was symbolic of God's presence with God's people. Um, there's only one problem. There isn't a river near there. <laughs> so we know immediately that this psalmist is using this as a metaphorical device. It's an image. Um, and what he's trying to say is that uh, this river symbolizes the, the opposite of what we saw in stanza one. It's the opposite of the life-taking, raging, roiling, chaotic waters, we have now in its place a river, a river of God, a river of life-giving gladness and God's power and provision, even in the midst of the worst imaginable trouble. If you remember way back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, as there's a river that flows out of Eden, you know, the image there is that life flows from God out of the Garden of Eden. And this image here of the psalmist is exactly the same, that um, this river of life flows from the heart of God to God's people. And we're told in verse 5, which is kind of the emotional center of this psalm, God is in its midst. God is in its midst. It shall not be shaken. Oh, notice how back in stanza one, everything was shaking. And now we're told in stanza two, God will help it. Yeah, God is in its midst. It shall not be shaken. God will help it. There's help again when the morning dawns. Nations rage, kingdoms shake. God raises his voice. The earth melts. Now, that doesn't mean that you know, we're having a meltdown. What it means is that everything stops in terms of the chaos. All is well. <laughs> and then we have our chorus. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Now, you know that the names that are used of God in scripture are not willy-nilly. I mean, they have great meaning. So the Lord of hosts um, is, in my vernacular, I would refer to it this way. It's the God of angel armies. You know how in um, the uh, account of Jesus's birth, you know, the shepherds are out in the fields and um, there's... Uh, you know, angels that uh, come out and proclaim, you know, the glory of God. Well, it's the same word that's used there. It's an angel army. It's a veritable, you know, heavenly host. It's this big army uh, of gods. And that's the image that we have here, the Lord of the angel armies. So the most powerful being of all, God, is with us. And then, oh, we shift to the God of Jacob is our refuge. So we've got God high, holy, lifted up, this God of angel armies. And then we've got the God of Jacob. It's a historical reference. And we shift our term for God there to Yahweh, 
The Yahweh of Jacob is with us. Yahweh is the covenant keeper God, the one who makes promises to us human beings, and we can trace our lineage back through Jacob and all of the cast of characters in the Hebrew scriptures. And that's just setting God in a historical context as the covenant keeper God who has kept his promises. So he's promised to be our refuge and he will be our refuge. Yay. All right, then I'm gonna bring it home. Stanza three. It starts with an imperative. Come, that's what that exclamation point means. Stop in your tracks. Don't go any further. I know you're worried about, uh, you know, the natural order quaking out of control and, you know, all this stuff going on in the world, but stop and come, do it now and watch what God is doing. Well, it's kind of confusion because where it says, see the deeds of the Lord, the desolations he has made on the earth. When we think in English of the word desolations, we think that something is being laid waste. And actually, the desolations of the Lord, God is not waging war. He's waging peace. So when the scripture is referring to the desolations, he is absolutely silencing everything else and bringing peace. How does he do that? Well, he causes wars to cease by shattering the bows, breaking the spears, burning the shields with fire. Those are the desolations. He's laying waste to those and waging peace. Shalom. And you know what shalom is about. Everything is being made right. It's being drawn together the way it's supposed to be. If you think about taking, a, you know, a, a pottery piece and throwing it to the ground and it shatters and you, you cry because it's your favorite pottery. Shalom. God brings all of the fractured pieces back together. Everything is right, just the way it's supposed to be. And then make note of it in verse 10 there. It's in quotations. Guess what? God is speaking there. And God says, be silent. And know that I am true God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. Sometimes we, and not that it's incorrect to read it this way, but sometimes we look at that and be still and know that I am God. And we think of it as a meditative sort of a phrase. And it can be utilized in that way. It's not wrong. But I, I, I really um, am loving that you're seeing this in context. I mean, God is absolutely bringing order out of all this chaos. And then finally, he says to us, be silent. Be silent and know that I am true God. Stop. Throw down your weapons. Let go. Depend upon me rather than yourself. See, the punchline of this is that our ultimate security lies not in our own strength, not in our own efforts or our own implements, our devices, if you will, but in the presence and power of God. We stand empty in ourselves, but strong in the Lord. And so we can go to the chorus and belt it out and say, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And we're going to trust this one who is our refuge, even in the midst of, you know, the worst imaginable circumstances. Yeah. Okay. Whew. That's probably quite enough. I, um, I gave you the words to a mighty fortress is our God, and I'm not going to go through them, although I hope you'll meditate on them on your own because they are so powerful. But the only point I want to make is um, the point of Martin Luther in writing this is that um, the logical progression, you know, in, in the psalm, um, the dwelling place of God, you know, is, is the temple, the city of God, Jerusalem. Uh, that's where God is with us, right, in the Hebrew mindset. But in the Christian scriptures, as we move forward, we understand, and early Christians understood, that Jesus became what the temple once represented, God with us. But God in human flesh now, not a temple, but God with us. Uh, Emmanuel, the incarnation. And that is God's ultimate pledge. We could fast forward from Psalm 46 to Jesus, because God is pledging, I will always be with you. 
I will always be a refuge. And here's how I'm making good on my promise. I'm coming among you in human flesh. And I'll live and die and rise that you know that I will never leave you or forsake you. So we place our trust not in a place, but in a presence who promises to be with us, to dwell with us forever, never leaving or forsaking us. So in the rest of our lessons, what we're going to encounter is how Jesus embodied the promises of Psalm 46, his encounters with real people just like you and me, and how they place their trust in him. <sighs> okay. I don't think I could say another word. That's what Psalm 46 says to us. And now we get to explore that in small group.